Hi guys, Ms. O'Connell here. So today we're going to be talking about the center of mass again. Um, we're going to be applying these to solving more complex problems. Okay, so today is the 23rd. And we're going to get started with a do now. So take a minute and your notes. Okay, uh, you can jot down the problem and your solution. Okay, so pause the video and give this a try. Okay, so a missile is launched with velocity V initial and explodes mid-flight into over 1,000 fragments. What is the velocity of the center of mass after the explosion? Okay, so we noted on Friday, right, that the center of mass of a system is dependent on the average location of that matter. If the position of the center of mass does not change unless there is an external force, that means that the velocity of the position of the center of mass can also not change unless there is an external force. When an explosion occurs, right, that force is internal to the system, meaning that each fragment all 1,000 fragments experience the same force, causing those fragments to move in opposite directions. That force is internal to the system. Therefore, the position of the center of mass will not change because there is no external force. So if the position of the center of mass was initially moving at an initial velocity of V initial, after the explosion, the center of mass of the system will still have an initial velocity of the initial. Okay, each individual fragment will have their own independent velocity, but the center of mass of the system, the location of where the average amount of matter is located, will still have the same initial velocity because no external force acted on the system. Okay, so that's an example of a conceptual type question that you might see on the AP exam. Let's take a look at some more complicated mathematical problems for center of mass. Okay, so example three, rotation about the center of mass. A 500 gram ball and a 2.0 kilogram ball are connected by a massless 50 centimeter long rod. Okay, so if an object is massless, we do not include it in our calculation for the center of mass. Okay, so if they tell you to ignore the mass or the surface area, okay, of a specific object, when they say to ignore the mass, that means that you do not include it in the center of mass calculation. If you're instead told the surface area is unimportant, you only find the x position of the center of mass, not the y, because the y is to be ignored. OK, so let's take a look at our system. So this drawing would be technically provided for you. It would not be labeled as so. But the 2 kilogram mass is on the left end of the system. If you're not given a coordinate plane, you assume that the object nearest to the left starts in an x, posi x position of zero, zero. Okay, so x, y here would be zero, zero because there is no y position. The 500 gram mass is on the opposite end of this massless rod, exactly 0.5 meters away. Okay, so please be careful of the units, right? Mass should be in kilograms and length should be in meters. We know that the position of the center of mass is going to be closer to the two kilogram object, right? The average position of the mass of the system will be closer to the larger object. 
but we don't know how close. So to figure that out, we have to use the equation for the x position of the center of mass. Okay, where we take the mass of the object times its position in the x plus the mass of the opposite object, okay, or the second point mass in our system times its position. And then we divide by the sums of the masses. We're going to take two kilograms times zero meters plus 0.5 kilograms times 0.5 meters. And then we add two plus 2.5, or sorry, two plus 0 0.5. We get 2.5 kilograms. Our kilograms will cancel and we will, we will be left with just meters. So the x position of the center of mass is 0.1 meters. So that means that R1 would be a length of 0 0.1 meters. Okay, and R2 would be a length of 0 0.4 meters. Okay, because it is 0 0.4 meters from the position of the center of mass. All right, so we're going to now take this application and apply it to uniform circular motion. Okay, so in part B, they ask what's the speed of each ball if they rotate about the center of mass at 40 revolutions per minute. So we're asked or told about speed here. Right, speed in uniform circular motion is the tangential velocity. So we need the tangential velocity of each ball, m1 and m2. They both rotate at a constant rate of omega. Right, omega is 40 revolutions per minute. So the rate of rotation is constant. The tangential velocity will depend on the radius. So we need to calculate the tangential velocity. So just to recap, right, the tangential velocity is equal to the radius of rotation times the rate of rotation, omega. Okay, r is the radius in meters, omega is the angular velocity in radians per second. We know that omega should be measured in radians per second. The value for omega that they give us is revolutions per minute. So the first thing that we need to do is convert. So we'll take 40 revolutions per minute, multiply by two pi radians per revolution. Our revolutions will cancel out. Okay, we need seconds, revolutions, uh, radians per second. So we're gonna take minutes in our denominator. We need minutes in the numerator for them to cancel. We have one minute over 60 seconds. So we take 40 times two pi divided by 60, we get four thirds pi radians per second. You can leave that as a decimal instead. Um, doesn't technically matter here, right? In pre-calc or calc, uh, your teacher will tell you to leave it in terms of pi in physics, we're not as particular. Either way works. So now we have omega in the correct unit. We need to find the tangential velocity of objects one and two. Let's start with mass one. So mass one is two kilograms. We know tangential velocity will be r1 times omega one. Omega for both objects is four thirds pi. So I'm going to take the radius r1, which is 0.1 meters because it is located 0.1 meters away from the center of mass. And this whole thing is 0.5. And we'll multiply that by omega. We get 0.42 meters per second. So the tangential velocity of this object is 0.42 meters per second. Let's take a look at M2. So M2 is technically 0.5 kilograms. We again need to find the speed or the tangential velocity. So we're going to take R2, 
which we know is 0.4 meters, and multiply by omega, which is 4 thirds pi. We get a tangential velocity of 1.66 meters per second. So they have the same rate of rotation, because, but because they're located in different radii from the center of mass, they have different tangential velocities. Okay, the further away from the position of center of mass or the axis of rotation, the faster the linear velocity must be in order to have that constant rate of rotation. Okay, I need to cover a further amount of arc length per unit time in order to move at the same rate as M.